The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, right, so today uh, our goal is to really go through this, uh, the paper that you read uh, maybe last night, uh, by Declan and Alon, Optimality and Evolutionary Tuning of the Expression Level of a Protein. Uh, it was published in Nature in 2005. I think that it's, uh, it's a very interesting paper uh, exploring some kind of big general ideas. Uh, I think it's also uh, in some ways rather, um, rather misleading. And so I'll, we'll, we'll try to understand you know, or discuss the ways in which uh, the, the connections between experiment, theory, prediction, and so forth um, how they, all, how they all play out in the context of, of this problem. All right. Before we get going too much on the science, I just want to remind everyone that uh, Andrew will not be having office hours today. He is off interviewing for um, MD-PhD programs right now. Uh, so, but I hope that, I hope that you, uh, if you had questions about the problems that I hope that you asked Saurabh uh, last night, you might be able to grab him after the lecture today. Um, but yes. All right, any, any, any other questions about? Anything before we get going? No. All right. Uh, so I think that uh, th this paper, uh, and in general, I guess uh, the lecture today, is, is really uh, a combination of trying to start thinking about uh, maybe laboratory evolution uh, or uh, kind of population level phenomena in general, um, as well as uh, this question of optimization in terms of protein expression. Okay. All right. So. Um, all right, can somebody just maybe summarize the, the big idea of this paper? Yes, please. Right. Okay. So that's that's the argument, at least, right? And they they have a very nice uh, first sentence here. Different proteins have different expression levels, right? You know, it's hard to argue with that statement. You know, nice, uh, concise. Right, but I, you know, the question is, well, you know, why? And I'd say that uh, there is a, a range of different philosophical opinions uh, out in the world. Uh, I'd say that uh, some group, and that is very much reflected in this study is trying to think of the, about this in the context of optimization. Right? Well, maybe the reason that we see a given level of expression of some protein is because, at least over evolutionary time in some ancestral environment that we don't know, but maybe it evolved uh, to optimize some cost benefit uh, problem. Right? Now, uh, and then I'd say that there, there's another kind of general philosophical approach that tends to be a little bit more uh, agnostic or just maybe more that more of a sense that uh, certainly things could have evolved to optimize something, but we can never really know where they evolved in, so we shouldn't be going out on a limb on these things. And uh, uh, given that this is philosophy, I will maybe not require that you agree with any particular standpoint, but I will say that it's at least worth thinking about the question, and maybe you can do measurements to, to illuminate whether this, all these ideas might make sense. Right. Uh, and, and then we'll, we'll try to, uh, over the next you know, hour and a half, figure out to what degree uh, this paper has, you know, maybe should convince us of uh, this optimization in the context of this particular um, protein. Right. Now, uh, j even if it's the case that somebody convinces you, maybe, that la expression of the LAC operon maybe does optimize some cost benefit else, that does not prove that every protein optimizes things. Right. So don't. Um, you know, don't get overwhelmed or underwhelmed or whatever it might be. Okay. Um, all right. So can, let's just first make sure uh, that we're uh, we understand what we mean by costs and benefits in this case. All right. Uh, can somebody pick one of them? Yeah. What what is a cost and benefit in the, in the context of maybe this paper? Yes. So. Right. Requires requires resources of some sort or another to um, 
to express these proteins. Uh, you know, and, and, and th this can manifest in many different ways, but, uh, but certainly if you were not making these proteins, you could have been making some other proteins. And so you know, if these proteins are not helping you, then maybe something else would have. Right? You know, but there, there are very many different ways of looking at this. Right? But, um, but there is some finite number of things that the cell can do. Okay? Um, all right, and, and the benefits, of course, in, in, the, in the case, and this is, this is in, the, in particular in the case of the lac operon, what does, uh, what does this network allow us to do? Yes, that's right. You get to consume lactose, right? In the in this for this in this case. Now we've already spent some time thinking or discussing uh, the lac operon. Um, what were the two key components in here? In the lac operon, what you know, if you were a cell and you wanted to. Eat lactose. What would you need to do? I'm picking somebody to. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, right. So the lac genes, but what? What? Maybe in more, a little bit more detail. What do we? What do we mean when we say the lac genes? Well, I mean, there, there's, um, I mean, just it's not just lactose, but I mean, what what are the things that have to happen if you want to eat anything? I guess, you know, you're a cell, right? So you first have to import it, okay? Now, in some cases, this can be done, maybe you know, for some maybe nutrients, it could be done even passively if it crosses the membrane easily. But for for most of the things that you might think about, you actually have to do active import. Right, so this is done by what? Anybody remember? LAC Y. Right. So LAC Y is, uh, is, is a membrane protein that imports, uh, imports lactose. Okay. Right. And, then, uh, and then what do you need to do? Right, you have to. You, then you have to. Um, you have to eat it somehow, right? Now, of course, metabolism is a very complicated thing, but um, the the key thing that's different between lactose and maybe the other uh, the simple sugars is that you first have to break down uh, break down the lactose into its constituent parts. So lactose is a disaccharide composed of two simple monosaccharides, right? So what you need is you need this lac Z beta galactosidase in order to cleave. That bond, and then you have the two simple amount of monosaccharides that can be that can be eaten. Okay. Uh, now the lac operon also has this lac A, and it's not quite obvious what that thing does, so nobody ever talks about it. But there is a third protein there. Okay. But what we always talk about is lac Y that's required to import the lactose, and then lac Z that is required to um, to break the lactose down into its monosaccharides. Okay. Uh, and then the idea, you know, and, that, and that's not sufficient. You don't. You don't take those monosaccharides and instantly make more cells out of it. But the idea is that the rest of the metabolic machinery is kind of there anyways to do other, you know, that's kind of some, some assumption. Okay. All right, now, uh, all right. Okay. All right, can somebody uh, explain how it is that they measured the cost of expressing uh, these proteins? Yes. All right, perfect. OK, so th there are several key things in here. So first of all, normally what we do is uh, it's lactose inside the cell that causes this lac repressor to fall off, and then you get expression of, um, of the lac operon. Right? So, uh, but, but in order to kind of um, sidestep or circumvent that normal network, what we are doing in this case is adding IPDG. Okay? So IPDG allows one to get expression 
of um, so this this and what they typically say is that this it, it, it stops the inhibition of uh, this lack uh, lack promoter where you get lack z and lack y. Wow. Okay. Now the the idea here is that you can control the level of expression of this operon, right? Because what we really want is we want to get or we want to measure a plot of something that you would call cost. And we'll, be, we'll explore a little bit more what that means as a function of uh, the lack operon expression. And, and this is often done relative to uh, the full induction of, of the wild type lack operon. Okay. And this is a relative growth rate reduction. So this is basically, a, this is a percentage, say, decrease in growth rate. Okay. Now, uh, there was a key thing that you brought up, which is that you want to measure the growth rate in the ab absence of lactose. Right? Because otherwise, as we increase the level of expression here, so we're controlling this by IPTG. Right? So there's some mapping from IPTG concentration to the level of expression here. Okay. But we want to we be able to measure the cost separate from the benefits. Right? So it's important then to grow this in the absence of lactose. Okay? So say no lactose. Okay. All right. But if I just take bacteria and I put them in a tube without, you know, with say minimal media, salts, so forth, but no lactose, are they are they going to grow? I mean, they need they need to grow on something, right? So wh what is it that the authors have done? Yes. That's right. They added some glycerol. Right? Uh, and in, in different parts, I think it's 0.1% glycerol. Does anybody happen to remember? Um, I think for most of it, it was 0.1%. OK, what? We'll say a little bit of uh, small concentrations of glycerol. OK. So the idea is that this is kind of a, a, a second rate carbon source. Right, so the, the bacteria are not super happy, but they're OK. Right? Uh, and, then, uh, and then given this, what they, what they were able to demonstrate is that if they did add lactose, they would have grown faster. Okay, so there's a sense that the lactose uh, does help the cells. Okay? But you have to have some glycerol, otherwise you can't really measure these things. Okay? Yeah. Well, OK, so first of all, what I was saying is that you have to have some carbon source. Sure. OK, right, so, if, you know, so you have to do something, right? Uh, you know, and and, you know, and to, it's just good conceptually to make sure you think about how you would actually do this experiment. Now, you have to, do, you have to add some carbon source. But the question is, well, what happens if you just added a, a bunch of glucose? Right? Uh, now, in that case, actually, for, for, for some of the other experiments, I think that would have caused problems in the sense that then, then there would not be any benefits associated with, with growing uh, or with adding um, increasing lack lack operon expression, right? For for this experiment in principle, one could have done that. Although you would re you really want to measure the costs and associated benefits in some environment, which you're going to be doing the later experiments. So I think it's really uh, I think from a conceptual standpoint, in principle, you could measure this in in glucose, right? But uh, but but then you'd always worry, oh well, maybe it's different, right? Oh yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so you, you could have broken that, but yeah, but in, but there's a, yeah. So in pr the other issue is that um, in in principle, uh, and they don't talk about this here, but yeah, if, if you had a bunch of glucose, then then you'd have to have another mutant in order to break the glucose repression of the you know because if you have this preferred carbon source glucose, then uh, then you'll naturally repress um, via CRP all of the um, all the alternative modes of of carbon metabolism just because glucose was kind of the best. Yeah. All right, and what, what was the key conclusion from this first uh, data plot? All right, nonlinear, right? The cost is a function of the lack expression, and it grows super linearly. I always forget what the difference in concave and convex is. I don't know if other people have this particular 
brain problem, right? But the second derivative is positive, right? In particular, what that means is that if you do draw some sort of like line, right? Then you know they have data that looks something like okay, so at, at here is 0 0.5, we have something that kind of falls below here, right? They had about 0.25, and it, it was also a little bit above uh, below, but crossed. They had a 0.75. And then they had a 1. Right? And why is it that they can't go above 1 here? Yeah. Why, why do they not have more data out here? You can't have more expression than full expression with this promoter. right? Because what they're doing is they're adding IPTG. So they can titrate between kind of zero and maximal expression from this promoter. In principle, you could always get another one, and then you should be able to go out further, right? Okay. Right. And uh, and and at maximal expression, they measure about a four percent growth deficit. Okay, zero point zero four. Okay. Just give a sense of scale. So this is a four percent deficit. All right. Now, I want to ask a more general question. All right. So let's imagine that you are measuring some quantity. All right. So we'll say this is some quantity y as a function of x. And let's imagine that the true y as a function of x looks like okay, something. Okay. Now, you go and you measure at multiple values of x, this, this curve, right? Because we're very interested in what this curve looks like. Okay. Now the question is, um, what fraction of the uh, error bars will contain this curve? And of course, contain this true curve. And so I'm assuming that this is this curve is is you know is the is the God given actual thing that you're you're measuring. You know, and so you measure this thing, you measure this quantity with noise, right? All right. So you, you, we measure this some number of times, some number of times, right? Do you, do you understand the question? All right, so here, contain the curve. There, it didn't. OK, so what fraction of the error bars um, will contain that, that curve? OK? Right, so, uh, OK, so, uh, and indeed, what we want to, you know, it's always good. To, all right, what were the error bars in the figure 2a in this? Right. Well, OK, so they're experimental error, right? And, and incidentally, how is it that they actually measure these things? Does anybody? Yeah, so these, these are actually a result of um, growing uh, on a, a 96 well, like a micro titer plate, where they use a checkerboard pattern. And they take uh, 48 different cultures. And they measure uh, the growth rates for each one individually. And they take. Um, then they're plotting the standard error of the mean. Do you, do, you, do you understand what I'm trying to ask here? Okay. So in that case, like, I mean, the size of the error bars, you just want a, a 
Well, right, well, let, let's let's we're yeah okay. So this is a good question, right? Well, well, fine. Okay, so. So it depends on n, where n is the number of samples that we took at each location. All right, question, yeah? Yeah, um, the standard error is just the root of the variance, right? So not the right, so, right, so standard error of the mean, this is an important question. Um, right, what you do is you calculate the standard deviation, divide by the square root of n. OK, now I, f I always forget whether it's n or n minus 1 now. Um, we already did 1 n minus 1, right? So OK, so it's, you, measure, you measure the standard deviation of the data, the standard deviation in y divided by root n, where n is the number of measurements you took at that, at that point. OK, but of course, when you measure the standard deviation, you, there was already an n minus 1, right? Have I, have I have I lost a minus one? Do you guys? Okay. Um. Yeah. Um, yes. And and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about what the difference is between a standard deviation and a standard error of the mean, and it depends on what you're trying to ask. Okay. Um. Do you guys understand what I'm trying to ask here? All right, well, let's just see where we are, and then we'll, we'll discuss. OK, ready? Uh, three, two, one. Okay. All right, so we got um, many A's, B's, C's. Nobody likes D, um, OK, but um, it's very common to see that. OK, um, all right. Let's go ahead and um, it, it's worthwhile. I think that there are enough, there's enough variation to, um, to decide. And if, if you, and in particular, between your neighbor, try to agree on why or why not. It might depend on n and so forth. OK? All right, we'll, we'll just have a minute to think about this. So what do you guys think? OK, now that's fine. Um. Um, 
All right, why don't we go ahead and, and reconvene so we can kind of try to figure out what, what is going on here. Um, I just want to see, I just want to see where, uh, if anybody has changed their opinion as a result of discussing with their neighbor. All right, let's, uh, let's see it. Three, two, one. Yeah, now, <laughs> some people are not even willing to. All right, okay, so this is interesting. All right, so now actually I, it seems like there is some convergence to, uh, to this. All right, um, I feel like the, you guys, um, in general, have uh, more accurate votes than past years somehow. Uh, I don't know if. Um, all right. Okay. So okay. So let's let's try to figure out why it might be that and what this thing standard deviation is. Yeah. Let's try to figure out what all these things are. Okay. Um, okay. So the idea is that we're going to measure some quantity, but with um, but it, it's a it's a it's a measurement with error. And for now, we'll just assume that the measurement error is, uh, is, is Gaussian distributed for, because otherwise we get confused and everything. All right. Um, OK, so let's say, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to measure some quantity with error. OK, so it's, right. Now, what we're interested in is not really the width of the resulting distribution, because that's a result of how accurate, you know, how good we are as experimentalists, right? What we're really interested in is um, is this true quantity, so the mean of our distribution, right? We want to know mean. Okay. Now, if you read the supplemental section of this paper, what you'll see is that uh, there's a significant standard deviation to their measurements, um, where the standard deviation, uh, you know. Uh, I, they don't actually quote exactly what it is, but they have plots of the histograms, which um, where, you know, where, like for example, this is a histogram of the different growth rate measurements across those 48 samples. Um, and actually, in this case, even, um, even more than that. Um, but what you see is that there's, the, the standard deviation might be 3, 4%. Right? So the standard deviation is actually something that's you know, big, right? Now the question is, uh, what we really want to know is how the mean of these distributions are shifting. Is we want to know something about this true underlying growth rate deficit, right? Because we're each individual measurement's a, a rather noisy measurement, okay? And indeed, in this case, the noise is larger than the signal. But if we believe that we don't have a shifting systematic error, then we can average that out just by making many measurements. Right, so the question is, so, so the standard error of the mean, what it's telling us about is that if you, if you measure this quantity n times, you get some mean. Okay. And so if, if, let's say that this is a, that, ooh, that's a little bit of, of a broad somehow Gaussian. Um, okay. So this is our, the, a histogram of our measurements of this thing. What we want to know is, is, the, is the mean of this distribution. Right? So this is similar to our discussion of super resolution microscopy. Right? And, and the question is, how will, this, how will the mean be distributed if you have these n measurements? It's a Gaussian distribution. Right? And it, it's, a, you know, it's certainly a Gaussian distribution because, of course, if we, we're, what we're doing is we're measuring a bunch of Gaussians, and we're going uh, you know, to add them all together, and then we're going to calculate the mean. So we definitely get a Gaussian. Right? And indeed, this is also, to, uh, because of the central limit theorem, this is also saying that even if your errors were not distributed super Gaussian, right, even if they were a little bit funny shaped, the resulting distributions of the means will look more like a Gaussian. Okay. Now, what we often plot is the standard error of the mean, which is kind of the plus or minus one sigma of the distribution of the mean. Okay? So if we go and we, we sample from this distribution n times, we'll get some value. If we sample from it again, we'll get some other value, so forth. Now, the distribution of the means we're going to calculate is not going to be a representation of the full standard deviation. But rather, it's going to be suppressed by this, by this root n, where n is the number that we're sampling. So if you 
look at the histogram of the means, you're going to get a Gaussian in here. OK, that's not a very nice Gaussian, but all right. with, uh, with a width that is uh, kind of the, st is the standard deviation divided by root n. Okay. Now, if we assume that we don't have any systematic error, then this distribution of means that you would have calculated, right? It, it's Gaussian. It's centered on the right value, but we, about a third of the time, it'll it'll be beyond the plus or minus one sigma. Right. And what that means is that it's about a third of the time. If you plot this standard error, the mean it should fall off of the kind of true curve. Okay. And this uh, basically does not depend on n, right? And can somebody say why why it doesn't? That's right. That's right. The true value. That's right. So what happens is that as you sample from this distribution a larger number n times, then your error bars shrink, but your measurements get closer to the curve, and those two effects cancel. So you should end up roughly with um, you know two thirds of the error bars you know containing this curve, or one third falling off. Right. And I think that uh, this is a little bit surprising, because there's always a sense that we feel that. There's something wrong with our measurements, or something wrong with our model, or whatnot. If uh, if any error bar does not contain the line, right? I mean, the, I feel like I often see there's this there's this effort that people have to try to make it so that um, that an er you know that these error bars always overlap with some underlying curve that is supposed to represent reality, right? But um, that's not in principle supposed to be true. Are there any questions about where we are right now? Okay. All right. Now, what I want to do is something slightly different, which is ask: Let's say that this is a curve that is not, you know, the underlying reality, but is instead a fit to the data. Right? How does this change anything that we um, anything that we've said, or does? All right. Well, okay. Let's do. do okay. Now. Okay. Okay. So we're going to say do fit. Okay. Question is, does uh, does this change the thing here? Do you understand? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Change. Okay. All right. A is yes. <laughs> B is no. Okay. Yes. Yeah, well, let's say that you know that this was um, this was a curve predicted by some fancy theory, but there's a you know you know there, you know that you have to specify, you know, the mass of something and the yes you know, so I don't know there are two you know two things you have to specify, and so what you do is you fit, and and the question is does it change what fraction of the error bars you expect to contain the true curve? All right, ready? All right, is is it not clear what I'm asking? <laughs> um, right, so the true curves. All right, we don't need to get in too much into this, but um, right, but you know, I mean, I, you know, the, the, right, the reason we're doing science is to try to get, you know, to look into the mind of God, right? So we've, we're doing a fit to try to, yeah. So, I mean, you can fit anything to anything, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> you, you see what I mean? Like, I, I, could, depends on what I could cook a curve that passes through each and every of these points. Like if you give me enough parameters. Okay. 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 All right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I think, but I think you're you're arguing for something already, maybe. Um, yeah. I don't know. But let's just say that this was a. You know. I mean. Okay. Let, let's just for concreteness. Let's say that I measured at 15 values of x. I have some error bars and some, you know, but then you know I needed three parameters to characterize this curve, and so those those I used to fit. 
Are you happier with three fitting parameters and 15 measurements? All right, let's just see where we are. OK, ready? Three, two, one. OK, so we have um, a majority of A, but a significant minority of B. OK, right? And, and, okay so and just to be a little bit more concrete, can somebody say why they're saying yes? Yeah, right. So the fit is somehow trying to get the curve to go near the error bars, right? And we're typically, when we do a fit, we're typically trying to minimize this mean squared error or deviation from our curve to the, to the data point, right? Okay. And how, in, in, how, how much do you expect this to have, make a difference? All right. So for concreteness, again, let's say that I had 15, 15 values of x. You know that I that I was measuring things at, right? Now, we expect, say, five of them, five will uh, will miss true curve. Okay. We decided, okay. roughly. Now the question is, what happens if we use, what happens if we instead of having this true curve, if we we do a fit using these three parameters? How much of a difference should it make? To this very, very roughly. Okay, we'll see. So, all right. So now I'm asking, how many of um, roughly how many of these uh, error bars do you expect to then miss the fitted curve? Okay, and and this is with we we. Use three fitting parameters, say. OK, that was parameters over there. All right, do you understand the question? All right, so instead of plotting this God given curve, instead we're plotting a curve that I'm giving you, where I use three fitting parameters to fit to the data. <laughs> and I, I mean, I, I'm just trying to get it roughly. I think that uh, this is I'm not a rigorous statement I'm about to make, but just so that we're all roughly on the same page. All right, ready? Three, two, one. Um, yeah, you know, um, right. So you know, it'll be somewhere in here, okay? Um, and I think this is not quite, quite true. But the idea is that, um, in particular, if you fit, if you make n measurements, and then you use n fitting parameters, in general, you will get a perfect fit, i.e., the curve will go through every single data point amazingly perfectly. Right? So if I give you 15 measurements across here, and then I give you a 15 degree polynomial, I guess we only need a 14 degree polynomial right, with 15 free parameters, then that polynomial will go through every one of your data points spot on. Okay. Not even a question of whether it, fit, whether it goes through the error bars. But I'm, t I'm saying literally OK. Right. Uh, right. And that's just because you're just solving an equation at that stage. Okay. Now, uh, this is a stupid statement, except that once you're kind of like, you know, in the heat of the moment, you know, eagerly trying to do some fitting for your advisor or whatever, um, it's easy to fall into this trap where you just kind of like, you know, add extra parameters. And then, you know, and then I, mean, I definitely remember in graduate school, I was like surprised. I was like, oh, this thing it works wonderfully, right? It's like it seems to, it's like magically goes through all my data. You know, I mean, um, and then, and, but then I felt very stupid like, you know, 30 seconds later. But, um, but this is just a, a very uh, easy thing to screw up and forget about. Right. So what this is saying is that if you if you see a cur if you're if in the course of your work or if you're reading a paper uh, and you see uh, you, you see some curve that and you want to know something about um, maybe how much information is it or whether things look reasonable given the data it's it's useful to kind of orient yourself relative to the, to these statements okay? that uh, depending on how many free parameters you're kind of using. You expect uh, 
larger or smaller number of these data points to kind of go through the, through the curve that you see. OK? Uh, but I would just want to stress that you don't want to be anywhere close to the point where you have the number of parameters equal to the number of, you know, uh, the number of uh, kind of measurements that you're making, right? And for any sort of reasonably reasonable curve describing what you hope is reality, you expect some, some of those um, data points with their error bars to kind of miss the curve. And that doesn't mean that they're sloppy experimentalists. It doesn't mean whatever. You know. Okay. Um, okay, now coming back <laughs> to the task at hand. Uh, right. Do, do you understand why, uh, why they're plotting the standard error of the mean rather than the standard deviation? Right, because what you're interested in, in principle, is not the, the, the question you're trying to answer is not how variable are their measurements, but to what certainty can they claim to know the actual, you know, God given real cost associated with expressing these proteins as a function of the expression level. And for that, you really want to ask about the standard error of the mean. OK, okay. Um, great. Now, um, now, OK, so now we can come back and ask about, um, you know, why, why did I just spend half an hour talking about standard error, the mean, standard deviations, fitting to data? But you guys are probably all asking yourself that question. Uh, but does anybody have an answer of why? Yeah. You can fit with different curves if you, yeah, I think that that's hard to argue with that statement. But the statement is a little bit like different proteins have different expression levels, right? Uh, all right, but a little, yeah, a little bit more concrete, maybe. Yeah. So in this case, I, I, don't, I didn't check the calculation, but if you have a natural line, then you can't make this calculation of optimization. Yeah, right. I think that, right. It's so, yeah. Okay. So I, I, you know, okay. So I think that this is a tricky thing. You know, the data certainly do argue for a super linear cost, but I would say that they argue for it rather weakly. Okay. And that if you if you look at their data and you just fit a line, you would say, you know, it's maybe okay, right? It's not, you know. And of course, once again, should we be surprised? That the quadratic fits better? <laughs> no, right? And this is a very, you know, dangerous thing. If you're comparing models, you know, it'll always be the case. If you add another parameter, it will look better, right? Uh, but the question then is, how strong of a case should we make of this? And then, how important is it for, you know, the conclusions of the study? Okay. Now. They, in addition to the line and the quadratic, they had another curve in here, which looks like, let me see if I can get it right for you guys. All right, so this is fine, tricky thing. OK, so I'm, all right, so that's the, da uh, that's the dash line. It looks very similar to the solid quadratic line. Okay, and can somebody remind us what the difference was between, between those two? Uh, Nonlinear cur curves that they had. I mean, why do they have two curves that look so similar? Right. Okay. So my dashed line is their red line, just to okay, the dashed <laughs> red in the paper. Right. So it's it's so it's some it's this line where there's a finite amount of resources or protein making machinery that the cell has, and if you use them up, then you don't get any growth. Right. And of course, that statement is kind of has to be true on some level, and the question is whether it's that's relevant here. Exactly. Right. 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 
Um, anyway, certainly, OK, I would say that one question is whether you can reject the hypothesis that uh, this cost function is a line. Another question is whether you can distinguish between the two quadratic or the two nonlinear curves based on the data. Right? And uh, I think the answer to the, to the second question is certainly not. Right? And they don't claim that they can. Right? But, um, but it's, it's important to just note that there's just, it's just impossible for them to distinguish. I mean, those, those curves are so, so similar over the entire range where they have data that those, it's going to be impossible to distinguish those two, those two things. Okay? But does it matter which of the two cost functions is, is the true cost function? Um, OK, so right. So what you're saying is that the two cost functions they have, they're, um, they, they behave similarly over the range that is relevant, maybe. So then it doesn't, therefore, it doesn't matter. Is that, or am I, OK. Um, all right, so why do they have two cost functions there, then? Why, why two nonlinear cost functions? Just to provide variety in our modeling. Right. Yeah. So okay. Right. So I, and what, what's the what's the later experiment they're going to do? Just so that we're. Um, um, I, it, well, you should ask me the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You regret opening your mouth now. Okay. Yeah. So what, what what is that? Okay. So yeah. So what is the experiment that they're they're going to do? Okay. So they're next going to measure the benefit, but that's uh, the, this question about the two cost functions is not yet, is not somehow relevant yet for the benefit part. Yes. Right. After after a long time, right? So they actually do laboratory evolution experiments where they grow uh, these bacterial populations in different lactose concentrations, and they look to see what level of the lac operon expression does the population evolve to. Okay. Right. So that what they're trying to do here is they're trying to say, okay, well, we can measure some costs as a function of expression. Maybe we can measure some benefits as a function of expression. And then from that, we'd like to be able to predict where the population will evolve to. Okay. Now, right. And, and, and they have these two nonlinear cost functions, which based on the data they have, they can't distinguish. But they say, oh, well, they're both kind of reasonable cost functions. Um, and, and in some ways, maybe the problem here is that they, the two cost functions are, are end up being wildly different in terms of predicting um, what happens for large uh, lac concentrations, where you would want to express more of the protein. Yeah. Right, do you guys do you remember this or not? Sort of. Okay. Okay. All right, and that's actually well, you might as well just look at that. All right, so that's figure four. If you, uh, that's uh, the normalized lactic activity that the populations evolve to as a function of the lactose concentration they're evolving in. And what you see is that uh, you know, this red curve corresponding to the finite resources cost function, it explains the data, whereas the other ones very much do not. Okay. All right. And that's just because these other models then pr would predict that if you grow the cells in a lot of lactose, they should express you know, out to five times the lac expression, you know, much, much, much more, right? which is not what they see experimentally. Okay. Yes? OK, but, but the idea of, of evolution is that evolution can make it a stronger promoter. Right? So because one, thing, one statement is, given this DNA sequence at that promoter, how much expression can you get? And the most you can get is this amount that's normalized to 1. But if you make mutations in that promoter, 
then you can then you could go out further. Right. right. So the, the question now is um, after you know we kind of tell you the results of these evolution experiments, how um, how much should that favor this dashed red line, the super linear cost function with finite resources, right? And on one level, you'd say, oh, well, that's pretty compelling. Okay. On another level, later people that have come and measured this find that it's basically a line. OK, um, okay, so, okay so then the question, you know, so, all right, so it seems to basically be not true within this range. I mean, it, it, it is the case that if you go out far enough, then the growth does go to zero. But we're, that's, that's much further out. All right, yes? After they like, did the experiment, they had, um, they had all their expressions like their share level. Why didn't they go back and do the experiment again to see what the share was? Like? Right, OK, so actually, one of these curves, yeah, so the, the triangle, the sort of teal triangle, does, it, do, it is indeed higher up, and it, it's kind of here. Right, so they do have a data point that is further beyond and is, is again, above, above that curve. Right, so that, that does provide somewhat further support for a nonlinear model. Um, but again, there's a question of how strong that should be and so forth. Um, and indeed, um, I'd say, like, for example, Terry Hua has spent a lot of time uh, characterizing growth uh, rates as a function of many, many things. Um, and he has uh, a lot of, if you, if you measure the, the, the relative growth rate as a function of um, protein express, you know, a non-useful protein expression, um, and, and what he finds is that this thing basically looks like a line in this axis where, and, and it, it saturates it around, when, if you're at 30% maybe of, uh, of total protein expression. Right. So this is a lot, okay. But uh, this is kind of where you know the cell just can't handle that. Okay. Um, and uh, so Terry Hua has has recently uh, been exploring a lot of these sorts of phenomenological growth laws, where he um, he imposes costs of various sorts and then looks at uh, the, how the cell kind of responds. And what he finds is just a remarkably large number of lines in various spaces that. Um, I find very surprising, uh, and um, but that he can he can understand using kind of some phenomenological modeling. Okay, but this is kind of one of like a dozen lines that he sees of various axes doing things. Okay, um, but the the point here is that as a function of the level of expression of these non-useful proteins, uh, what he what he sees is that for a variety of different proteins, including beta gal, but also beta lactamase and other uh, proteins that are not being used in that particular environment, what he sees is that the there's there's basically a linear. Uh, cost growth uh, as, uh, as you, you impose this, this non-useful protein expression. Okay. Uh, so I'd say that, the, that this basic statement of it being not, this not the statement of, of cost being super linear, I, th I think, uh, ends up not being true. Okay. Now, what does it mean for this paper? Yeah, right. So it's it's you know it's an interesting right. It's, it's a very interesting hypothesis. They did nice evolution experiments where they saw the population adapt to different levels. Um, but what does it mean about the predictions in particular? You know, in the sense of if you measure costs and benefits, and then you want to predict where it's going to evolve. Um, what does um, what what happens if if it's the case that cost as a function of expression is actually linear? Then what does that mean? for their ability to predict what's going to happen. Yeah, uh, right. So the problem is that if you actually use a linear function here, then um, their, their model doesn't even predict um, 
that there should be an optimum because their benefit function ends up also being essentially linear with the amount of, uh, of this protein expressed. So if you have two lines, right? Okay, so overall, so growth, you know, is something like goes as benefits minus costs, right? So, and this is maybe, this is a relative growth, right? So if you have a line here and a line here, no optimum, right? So that's kind of a bummer, right? Uh, but it doesn't mean that that's, I mean, in, in biology, eventually things are nonlinear, right? So there should be some optimum, optimum. And actually, what I would say is that I think that the nonlinearity is probably actually here. That's the, the nonlinearity that's relevant, maybe, is, is dominated by, the, by on the benefit side rather than the cost side, right? So what, my guess of what's going on here is that rather than the costs growing super linearly with the expression level, rather the benefits will be sublinear with the expression level. And wh why, might, why might that be? Right, you know, at some point, it's just that the cell doesn't need more sugar, right? Then, and then it's not going to be as useful, right? And even before you get to that regime, I think there, there, are, there are various ways in which uh, cells may be able to use the, um, use the sugar more or less efficiently, depending on how much they have of it, which means that as, you know, and this is just like for us, you know, the first slice of pizza is great, but then once you're at the fifth one, you start to feel a little bit full, right? So in general, benefits as a function of anything should have some saturating kind of behavior, right? Uh, and I, and I, my, my sense is that this is basically why there's an optimum here. Okay. Now, of course, they, they're very, I'd say that they're, um, all these cost functions behave very similarly in here. So the predictions that they make in here are really not very sensitive to the, which of the cost functions they use. And those are all still then relevant and valid, right? It's, uh, the question is just trying to predict what happens beyond the range that you have data is very hard because it depends very much on what your curve does past that region, right? Okay, um, okay but we haven't, um, so I, I, I guess I've, I've made an argument that I think that in, maybe what's happening is that the benefit function here is nonlinear. But what, what did they actually do to measure the benefits? Because this is, this is not, I think, totally obvious either. Well, what should I be plotting? Okay, well, this is still a relative growth rate. Uh, and here, this was actually lactose concentration. So this is not lack expression, which is the most obvious thing that you would want to do. But that's harder, right? Um, and what they show is that their model is sort of consistent on this axis, OK? This is external lactose. Okay. And the idea is that here is zero. In the absence of any lactose, if you induce the lac operon, then you're at this minus 4.5% or whatnot. Okay, so it kind of starts out uh, down here. And then up here, it comes out up to above 0.1. So, so this is the 4, maybe 4.5%. 4 this is up here around 10%. And you end up with a curve that kind of goes from you know four or five percent deficit up to ten or eleven kind of percent advantage, right, and this is at con this is at full induction of the lac operon. Okay, you know what what this is saying is that you know if you're making the proteins to to break down consume lactose, then there's a cost, right? That's just how they plotted it, right? Uh, but that the benefits do indeed outweigh the costs at some concentration of lactose. Okay. 
But then here, there's, uh, there's a saturation. And here, the saturation in their model, they, they get a saturation just because of uh, the, the dynamics of import. Right? So what they assume is that there's michaelis menten kinetics for import. Right? So the, the import rate kind of goes, um, goes as the uh, concentration of uh, the lactose divided by some k plus the concentration again, of lactose, right? right. So because michaelis menten dynamics. Okay. Um, but of course, if you have more of the protein, lac y, then you'll be able to import more. Right. So just because you have saturation as a function of lactose does not mean that you'll have saturation in terms of uh, the number of proteins that you're making, right? Do you understand why I'm saying that? Okay. Um, you know, and, and indeed, I would say that many, um, many underlying models could have been consistent with this data as well. So I, I'd say that this, their data does not um, reject the hypothesis that the benefit function is, su function is sublinear. Ah, okay. Okay, so you're you're saying that um, evolution might be able to change other things as well to kind of fiddle. Yeah, um, I think this is an important question, and I, and I think the basic answer is that there are some things that are easier for evolution to do than others, uh, and also that some things have maybe already been optimized. Okay, now, and, and relative to this point, so they they did these uh, laboratory evolution experiments, and there was one category of mutation that they did not see. Does anybody remember what that was? All right, what, what's the most straightforward way of kind of getting around all this cost-benefit discussion that we've just had? The one thing that they did not see was um, significant improvements in the enzyme. Okay. So they, they checked and they, they found that they did not see any increase in the laxi activity um, normalized by the amount of, uh, of the laxi that was being made. Okay. Now, uh, that might make sense because if you know, this enzyme has already been, you know, gone through millions of years of optimization to, to break down lactose, then it's reasonable to say, oh, well, in the next 500 generations in the lab that maybe won't improve. Okay. Of course, you always have to be careful about this because it could be that some sequence slash structure is best when you're thinking about, you know, when is it that E. coli might see lactose? Our gut, right? Okay. So you imagine you have bacteria in the gut. That's a different environment than in the lab. Right, so it, it could be very well that the enzyme, because of the pH and all these other things, uh, the enzyme actually could adapt to the lab, even though it may have already be, been adapted to our gut. So you, have, so you have to be careful about this kind of argument always, right? But, um, but you know, of course, once you see the result, then you say, oh, well, that's because of this, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so I just want to make sure that we know what these experiments look like. So they, they went for 500 generations. Um, so it's useful to ask how long this experiment should have taken. Okay. All right. Is it closest to three days, three weeks? Uh, 
All right. All right anytime you, you read about an experiment, uh, it's useful just to have some notion of what the authors went through in order to bring you the results you're reading about, right? Um, if you uh, are not sure, you can just make a guess. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. All right, so we have some number of A's, some number of B's, and a couple C's. Okay, well, you know, one thing you might say is, you know, how, how, how fast can E. coli divide? Okay, so, well, you know, on one level you might say, oh, well, 20 minutes. Right? That should give us, what, 75-ish generations a day. So we should be able to get here, all right, in a week or something. Right? Maybe. Okay. But that's not what they did. Okay? You know, for several reasons. First of all, this would be in rich media. Uh, in the environment that they're doing this in, it's a bit slower. But that, that would get you maybe to the three, you know, you know, two, three week mark. Okay. But that still is not what happened. Right? They actually had to go for three months. Okay. And, um, and this is because experiments are not always keeping cells constantly dividing at their own maximal rates. Right? The standard way that we do this is what's uh, known as kind of daily batch culture. And does anybody know how much they diluted by each day? Um, yeah, so it, I think it was, it, was, it was diluting by a factor of 100, right? So it's um, daily batch culture with 100x dilution, right? Which corresponds to about, I think, 6.6 .6 generations per day. Right, so this is very far from what you would think of as kind of the, the best they could possibly do. Right? And, and what it means is that, yeah, it does take about three months for them to have done this experiment. Okay. It also means that if you look at the number over the course of each day, right, they say this is n max, and they do dilute. This is n max over 100, right? So they dilute by a factor of 100. Okay. When you transfer cells from a saturated state into a new environment, do they start dividing immediately, for those of you who have done this experiment? No. It, it's going to take an hour or two for them to get going. But then they're going to start dividing. And this is on a log scale, maybe. log n, right? And what you'll see is they kind of go, they, they're dividing exponentially, and then they saturate. Indeed, they're going to saturate for amount of, a fair amount of time, right? So this, this might be an hour or two. This is, might be, say, five hours. But then you still have another roughly 20 hours to go, right, before the next solution, right? And then we repeat. Okay. So they're actually saturated for a fair fair fraction of the day. Okay. Now, in, in all these discussions of laboratory evolution and in many of the calculations we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks, the, uh, we'll, we'll typically assume that what is being optimized is the growth rate, the rate of division. Okay. But you can imagine there being other things that might possibly be optimized in the course of these sorts of experiments. Can somebody volunteer what are other things? Right, so you could imagine if you could just you know, eke out one more division out there, right? then you could uh, get an advantage. And there's a whole set of interesting things, these growth advantage at stationary phase or the GASP mutants, where the focus is on trying to do well here. And also, you can imagine related, maybe a, um, if you do better out for this period, because uh, cells will, eventually, will start dying eventually. Right, so if you have a lower rate of death at saturation, then you can also spread. Okay. Other, yeah. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. What's the possible reason for the initial delay in growth rate at the beginning? 
Yeah, um, right. So I think it's basically that when, when the cells are saturated, they're, um, they generally enter um, a, a, a rather distinct physiological state as compared to the dividing state. Um, and I think the, the longer they sit in this saturated phase, the longer it's going to take them to get going in and, um, and the next day, for example. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, it's also the case that uh, cells in, these, in like saturated culture tend to be more resistant to a variety of uh, perturbations of various sorts. If, you know, if you're talking about heat, salt, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. Okay. But what, what's something else that could be uh, optimized here? If you were imagining you're a cell, you want to spread, what would you do? Yeah, okay, right. So uh, we're saying that the media is specified uh, by the experimentalist. So you're just you're the cell in this Gedanken experiment. Cells? Right. So you can eat the other cells. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, and in particular, actually, out here, this is part of how the gas mutants spread, is that they, you know, when other cells start to die, they lyse their contents. And then, um, and then the, the cells that are surviving can actually eat the contents. Yeah. Is this a way to like, coordinate between different cells so that they are actually uh, you know, distributing cells in the media? So, you know, you can, you know, OK, right. So I'm actually assuming here it's well mixed so that, uh, so that that's not, uh, yeah, but that, that in principle would not be an issue. But uh, yes, yeah, so you can imagine spatial effects of various sorts being relevant. Um, yeah, I, you know, I guess I just, I, mean, the, I just drew this up here to highlight that in principle you can also um, min, uh, decrease the lag, lag time. Right? So if you, if you start dividing more rapidly at the beginning of the day, then, um, then you can, you, you'll get to spread before your neighbors, and you, your genotypes will indeed spread. Right? Right. Uh, you're asking whether the, the yeah whether a cell that entered the beginning of the stationary phase that same cell would have a pretty good chance. Of yeah, you know, I think uh, over over I think this sort of 12-hour type period, I think the answer is yes. But if you go for um, an extra day or two, then I think you'll you'll you can start getting extensive cell death. Um, then yeah. would I maybe long enough though to maybe go from the clock to like a minute and just about to spread? Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 So people have thought about, and I'm not sure if this this That's particular exactly effect is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, but I just want to mention that this this is something that you kind of maybe would expect. Indeed, you you see in these. Um, so there are a famous set of experiments done by Richard Lenski um, at uh, at Michigan State, where he's um, he's been dividing, you know, six or eight, um, you know, doing daily batch dilutions of um, E. coli cultures now for for decades. Okay, so he started, I don't know, late '80s or so. I don't know if you guys remember. Yeah, but um, yeah. So he's gone tens of thousands of generations and has seen um, a bunch of remarkable things. Uh, one of the things that he has seen, as, as you might have expected, is a decrease in the lag time of the bacteria. Okay. Um, All right, so now, okay, so what we have now is a situation where they, um, they add IPTG so that the, um, all the cells are, in principle, start out expressing the lac operon. And then they grow, uh, they grow the cells over time. What they see is that um, the lac Z activity, all right, it starts out at being one normalized, right? Uh, for all the cultures, because there's um, IPTG, so it doesn't matter how much lactose there is. But what they see is that, is that over time, they see things that look like this. All right. So the, the 0 0.5 millimolar lactose do, didn't change very much. But if you look at uh, some of the others, like no lactose, there was a significant decrease in expression, whereas up here at, for example, 2 millimolar lactose, they see an increase. Okay. All right, so what you see is that 
there really are evolutionary changes of uh, these strains because, and it's very, very, very relevant that they, they had IPTG in the media. So if, if, if they did this experiment without IPTG, do you have any sense of what, what would kind of happen to the cells? I mean, how would that change the results? Right, so the, the, the expression would be determined by the lactose. Right, but let's say, that after, let's say that after 500 generations, we put them all in a millimolar lactose. How, do you, how different do you think they're going to be? I mean, do you think that the culture grown, for example, in the absence of lactose, do you think that it would still be able to eat lactose after 500 generations? in that experiment? Hmm? Yes, OK. And yeah, so what's the difference? I mean, why, why, are, why are you saying yes? Or what's the? Um... Well, yeah, so, right, so, okay, so, what we're, so this is an experiment with IPTG, right? And I, I'm just trying to think about or imagine what would have happened if they had done the same experiment without IPTG, right? just growing in that environment. In particular, if you grow minus IPTG and then minus lactose for 500 generations, okay. Okay. and then what we, I want to ask is, okay, let's say that you go over there and you just add lactose. Will the cells, do you think, be able to grow on the lactose? OK. Yeah, so why is it that here the answer seems to be no? Right. So here we've evolved a population that um, not only is it not it's not expressing the laxity activity here, but indeed if you put lactose in there, it doesn't express. Right. So these, these cells can no longer grow on lactose. Okay. So what, what's the key difference here? Yeah. yeah. Right. Now I think this is, this is just really important. Right. So in this case, there's approximately, we'll say, no cost to having, um, having the lac offer on there because it's just not being expressed. Okay. So then the only cost is associated with DNA replication. Right, so the, the advantage associated with uh, shutting off or removing the ability to grow on lactose is, is really minimal. And indeed, in this culture, uh, they, they actually, uh, they, the authors did say uh, what happened. Yet the entire gene was deleted, right? Yeah, right, right. So it was almost a KB was just removed from the genome. And that KB included the, the, the promoter. And so it was, um, so that it just, yeah. Unable, so it's not going to be able to grow on lactose anymore. Okay. Um, but the key thing is here, these, these cells were subject to this 5% cost associated with making the lac operon, right? which means that that mutant that appeared, it had a 5% advantage, and so it was able to spread throughout the population. Okay. Whereas what they could see is that um, the level, the evolved laxity activity indeed was different depending on how much lactose they had in the culture, right? And this is in the presence of IPTG, so there was um, that they removed that, that feedback loop. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and in these experiments, any way you slice it, the normalized laxity activity did not go above around 1.2 or 1.3, right? So there is some nonlinearity that is somehow constraining those cells from going up to, to, um, to, to increase expression uh, very much beyond the wild type. Okay. All right, we are uh, out of time. But on, uh, on Tuesday, we'll, we'll start talking about um, evolution, in particular in the context of neutral evolution, as kind of a null model to try to understand these dynamics. And uh, we will also talk more about why it takes as long as it does before you start seeing anything happening here. All right. If you have any questions, please feel free to come on up.